together and let's lift our voices as you unite our hearts as we sing Hosanna. of our minds and our hearts this morning. We hail you as King, Lord, as we sing Hosanna. Pray that you would be lifted up, that you would be lifted high in this place, in our hearts. We 
worship you, Jesus, for who it is you are and all that you do and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing this with me. If you remember this tune.
here to do exactly that. We're here to, do, to declare that He is King of kings and to worship Him with all of our being. Amen. Go ahead and grab your seat for just a few moments. We have someone that has come this morning to place our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, as our King through baptism. So why don't we focus your attention to the baptistry this morning. Good morning, church. What a wonderful song to lead us into this moment of baptism and praise forever to the King of Kings for what he has done in our brother James's life. And James, what is your testimony of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. It's wonderful. He is the way. Brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is so awesome, absolutely so awesome. It's just so meaningful every single time we see it. And right, we keep seeing it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday of people just coming to Christ, asking Christ to enter their lives, going public with their faith by being baptized. It's just a movement of God that is happening among us, and I'm so grateful that I get to see it. Hey, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much. Uh, for being a part of this service. It's special for a lot of reasons. Uh, And one is that it's Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday for us is a day that we celebrate uh, with the Lord's Supper. And so this service is going to culminate in a meaningful time of the Lord's Supper. And I hope your hearts uh, will be uh, ready for that. Uh, This is a Uh, traditionally what is called the beginning of Holy Week. And so all of this week, uh, our hearts and minds are just turned toward Christ uh, and His death on the cross and His resurrection uh, the following following first day, the following Sunday. And so it's an incredible week for us. Hey, let me welcome you if you're new to Bear Creek. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a bulletin. And if you do, uh, inside is a welcome slip. We'd love it if you'd fill out that slip. Uh, Pay close attention. There are ways that you can ask for more ministry, a prayer need, or uh, other things. If you'd rather do it digitally, if you'll notice there, you can text the word MORE to 84576, and you can do it that way. But if you fill it out, you can drop it in the uh, offering plate. Or if you take it to our welcome desk, we have a great gift, a wonderful gift we'd love for you to have, and that would mean uh, a lot to us. Let's talk about Easter for a moment because we should be ready for that. First of all, uh, hey, Bear Creek family, would you pray for it? And I mean, I'm serious. Would you pray for it that God would just do some really fruitful things and that people who are without Christ would be in this place and that we could share the gospel in a way that could be life-changing to them? So that's number one. Second, Uh, Pay close attention to the schedule, and you have it uh, in a bulletin there, but if you don't, here it is. Saturday, to to accommodate all who will come, Saturday late, uh, Saturday at 5 p.m. will be our first Easter service. And so maybe that would fit your schedule to come on Saturday rather than Sunday. We invite you to be a part of that. We have like this epic egg hunt for kids right after. That will be awesome, in fact. And so maybe that fits you or your schedule. It would be great. And then then 9.30 Easter Sunday morning, 11 o'clock Easter Sunday morning, and then 12.30. And 12.30 is open to you if you speak Spanish. Uh, because uh, we're going to do this great Spanish service at 12.30. So there's our schedule. I'd invite you to be a, a part of that. If your schedule could veer you away from 11 o'clock, that would be great. But if you can't, that's fine. But if it can veer away from 11, that would be awesome because we think we're going to have lots of, uh, 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 lots of pressure there in terms of people who Uh, be a part. So thanks uh, for listening to that. Uh, Another word before we pray together, those of you who are part of Bear Creek family, you know about this. Uh, We're at the culmination of a movement called First Things First, and the last portion of First Things First is all about uh, us committing ourselves to give to the gospel in just an incredible way. We have a huge vision for the next two years for how we invest ourselves into the gospel. And so we've asked our church family, really challenged our church family, uh, for each one of us to commit ourselves to that and actually record that commitment so that we can, listen to this, this just makes sense, right? So that we can know whether we can go or not go, right? How do we know if we can 
Uh, if we can expand our second venue, if we don't know what our church uh, is committing, how can we uh, commit ourselves to commit a uh, uh, million dollars over two years to missions if, if we don't know where we are? So I'm inviting you to do that. There are first things, first commitment cards and seat backs in front of you. They're confidential. You can fill that out. I'm inviting you to do that if you haven't done that yet. And so fill it out. You can drop it in one of the giving receptacles that's in the back of this room. There are the silver things that are standing up there. And so let me uh, encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, I want us to uh, pray together. Let's reset here and realize where we are and, and, and what is happening in this room. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the, Lords of, uh, and the Lord of Lords. We're here to worship the one who came as God in flesh and went to the cross for us for our deepest need, our sin, our rebellion toward him. We're here to, we're here to bow the knee to him as our king. And I hope that you would reset into that. We're going to worship the Lord with an offering now and then worship with our voices. Let me ask our ushers to come. And Father... This offering is an act of worship. It's where we take what you have given us, how you have blessed us in tithes and in offerings, and we give them back to you to show you that we want our lives to be an offering to you and to show you that we have bowed the knee and your king and not me. We trust you with that and we worship you now and we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's worship together.
declare you as king in this place, Lord, king of our lives, of our hearts. The ruler, the leader, God, of our lives, Lord. We submit to that this morning. We submit to that leadership, that kingship. We declare you as king. God, be lifted up in this place as we worship you through song, through word, just through community, God, that you would be lifted high above everything. We love you and pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, you may be seated. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. So maybe you're familiar with that voice. That is the voice of the well-known 20th century preacher, Dr. S.M. Lockridge, one of the most well-known and well-revered black preachers in the American experience. And um, uh, do you know uh, about 40 years ago, about 40 years ago, I sat in a vast auditorium and heard him preach that well-known sermon, and it was the most stunning thing because of how it lifted up Christ and because uh, of just, the, just those words washing over you of this is who Jesus is. And that's the experience that I want us to have in these moments. I've prayed so much about these moments that God's Spirit would just move in us in just the freshest and most phenomenal way and create reset in us. So today is Palm Sunday, and if you're a little fuzzy on what Palm Sunday is, uh, it represents the day that Jesus uh, rode into Jerusalem for the last week of his life before 
He went to the cross. It initiates traditionally what we call Holy Week. And, and so there's so much interaction between uh, the Lord Jesus and the Pharisees and, and, and just so much complexity all of that week that culminates with him being arrested and then falsely tried and, and sentenced to death and then, um, um, and then uh, uh, executed for our sin on the cross, but then exactly one week later, the tomb is empty, and he rises from the dead, and this day, Palm Sunday, initiates all of that, and I want us to talk about what it means. I just want us to talk in a super simple language, I want us to talk about what it means. Palm Sunday gets its... Um, uh, it's term, Palm, Palm Sunday, because Jesus, Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and he enters on this donkey, and the people sort of go crazy. They cut palm branches, and they take their coats and lay, it on the, lay them on the, uh, on the road, and they throw the palm branches down, and some are waving them. And, and all of that is the way you welcome a king. In fact, about 170 years before, they had done the same thing for a, for a man named Judas Maccabees. Judas Maccabees had defeated the, the enemies of Israel, defeated the, the enemies of Judah, and when he entered into Jerusalem, Jerusalem, presumably on a white stallion, the very same thing happened. He, he entered as a king. Unfortunately, he died in battle just a few years later. But, but it's a familiar scene, and everyone, everyone in the city that day, they can see and they perceive, they know what's going on. This person coming in Jerusalem is coming in as a king. He's coming in as a king. And I just want to read the, the incident from Sacred Scripture, Matthew 21. But when they had approached, they is Jesus and his disciples, and there's kind of a larger band of people with them. But when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, so Bethphage is like a, uh, is like a suburb of Jerusalem. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite of you and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. And if anyone says to you uh, anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately they will send them. Verse 4, this took place, Matthew's writing. Matthew is writing primarily uh, uh, to convince contemporary Jews of his day that Christ is the Messiah. So, so he writes, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet um, um, here it is, verse 5, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even uh, on a coat and the foal of a beast of burden. Verse 6, and the disciples went and did just as he had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on him, and he sat on the coats, and most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road, and the crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed after him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Son of David is a kingly term. It means a king. Uh, they were shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Uh, that word means Lord save, Lord save us. Uh, uh, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred up. And they were saying, who is this? This is the word of God. This is the recording of Palm Sunday. And I want it to mean something important to you. And in fact, here's the idea of the message. Take a look at it. Here's the meaning. Here's the meaning of Palm Sunday. Jesus declares himself king. That's it. The meaning of Palm Sunday is that Jesus declares himself king. And that, and that, sh that should become incredibly real and personal to you. That ought to be a, an incredibly real and personal reality to you. That's what I want to happen over the next few minutes. And so uh, it, took me, it took me some years to realize what Palm Sunday actually was in the event itself. 
Uh, I mean, uh, for, a, for a time I thought, you know, Palm Sunday was just the day that Jesus came in Jerusalem at the beginning of the Passover week. Then I began to recognize, well, it wasn't just that, but it was entry into Jerusalem to get people's a- attention. Not so much like Jesus, but it was, he was coming in in a way to get their atten- uh, attention. And then, and then suddenly I realized after some years, Jesus was orchestrating something here. Jesus was orchestrating a coronation parade for himself. I mean, that kind of changes everything to see what was really happening in the moment. And what's so unusual and what's so hard about that is this behavior is like nothing nothing like Jesus. I mean, right? Think of Jesus when he he heals a leper and he says, shh, don't tell anybody I did it. Think of him when he feeds the 5,000 in Galilee, uh, uh, and, and they come to take him by force to be king. And what does he do? He goes and hides in a mountain. Think about where 90% of his ministry was. Uh, the vast majority of the time he stayed out in the rural areas around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and not in Jerusalem. It's like he was constantly pushing away public attention. But then suddenly, in the last week before he would go to the cross, it just turns and he does this incredibly public thing, and that is he's declaring himself king with a coronation parade. And so it's Palm Sunday, maybe A.D. 30. If it's Palm Sunday, A.D. 30, this is April 2nd, A.D. 30. That day was a declaration. That day was a day of declaration. And I just want us, to, I want us to pull just two insights from it, just two. And the first one I'm already making, but let's dig uh, into it. And that is the meaning of Palm Sunday is this, Jesus declares himself king. And I want to drive that because Jesus drove it uh, in this event. And so the point of these 10 verses is is all of the preparation that goes into it. And so the point I'm making here is look at Jesus' activity. He is is, um, deliberately creating this event for himself. Verse 1, he stops in Bethphage, uh, the suburb, and, and it's a preparation point. It's like a staging area for the parade. And so, he's, uh, verses 2 and 3, he's making these meticulous plans, arrangements to acquire a donkey, not a white stallion, a donkey for him to ride into Jerusalem. Verses 4 and 5, Jesus is fully aware and clearly he's fulfilling the prophecy uh, about him in Zechariah 9 about Messiah, the king, riding into Jerusalem on this humble donkey. This is a prophecy uh, 600 years before it would happen. Uh, This prophecy is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we have actual copies of. And so so even the copies are 300 years older than than the moment that Jesus uh, does it. Then in verse 9, Apparently, the crowd was, was, was divided into two cohorts, one, one part of the crowd that went in front and another part of the crowd that, that, that followed. And, and look, I'm just making the point. Look how deliberately Jesus is doing this because it's a declaration. And that declaration is, I'm coming to you as your king. And everybody knew what that was. I've already mentioned Judas Maccabees. 170 years before, he, he defeats the, uh, the Seleucid general Nicanor. Uh, and, and as a result, he enters into Jerusalem. And presumably, it's on this white steed. And it is to exactly the same kind of uh, entry, except he doesn't really last. About three years later, he dies in battle. And so this, this was a person declaring himself king. And it's not just that Jesus was being so deliberate about it, everybody recognized it. Everyone knew what was going on. They knew what all of this meant. Um, Coming in the way that the Old Testament prophets said that Messiah would come. That 600-year-old prophecy from Zechariah 9 I want you to see it because I just want you to see how Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy. And, and that's actually Zechariah, Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9. And, and there the verse says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
Now listen to this. Behold, your king is coming to you. And he's just and endowed with salvation. And he's humble. And he's mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, foal of a donkey. Righteous, bringing salvation. Humble, mounted on a donkey. Um, this is Jesus' self-declaration. I am, I, I am the Messiah King, not just over the city of Jerusalem, but he's making this cosmic declaration, I am the Messiah King over all of humanity. But, but there's something sort of deeper going on. He's expressing his true nature as king. Earthly conquering kings, they ride in in war horses. I mean, white stallions, so powerful that the rider can hardly hold the reins. But Jesus rides in in the humblest way possible. He comes in on a little donkey. I mean... You would think it would be laughable to do that, right? Just like laughable. I mean, what president have you ever seen on Inauguration Day go, going down Pennsylvania a Avenue, enters, um, in, you know, enters the area uh, in, in a used Chevy Nova with Bondo on the side? If you have a used Nova with Bondo on the side, write me an email, okay? I will apologize personally to you. But Jesus is just telling you, I am nothing like an earthly king. That's what's going on here. I am nothing like an earthly king. My power comes from my surrendering, not from my attacking. I am coming in Jerusalem to claim my rightful place as your king, and I'm doing it by surrendering my life to you, for you. And look, everybody in Jerusalem that day, uh, you know, I know you think uh, that I'm coming as a conqueror to fix all the superficial stuff in your life, to get Rome off your backs, to get rid of the, ta of the tax collectors, to dial down the Pharisees and all their demands they put on you. But I'm coming for something so much deeper. I'm coming to conquer your deepest enemy, your worst oppressor. I'm going, to, I'm going to the cross to take the divine wrath on human sin that you deserve. For all the ways that you rebel against God, for all the ways you mistreat one another, I'm going to take the punishment for that and suffer infinitely for that to pay the price that your sin has incurred. And ultimately, this act of dying will repair everything. I will make everything ultimately right. That's why I'm entering Jerusalem today. That's why I'm riding on the back of a colt. But it's also, I am the, listen, this is the most important thing but also this is who I will be to you, your king, your king. I will be the sovereign over your life. Now look, either that means something or it's meaningless. And that's the second principle. I want us to go to the second principle. And so, look, the first insight, the first insight, what, what is Palm Sunday? It's Jesus declaring himself king, uh, Messiah, king over all of humanity. Uh, and either that's real or it's not real. But then secondly, secondly, that claim deserves something. His claim deserves something. It deserves from you and me an honest response, an honest response. We see all the responses there in verses 9, 10, and 15. The crowds are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, um, and when he entered Jerusalem, all the city was saying, who, who is this? They, they were proclaiming him king that day, that day on Sunday by, by Friday they're screaming at the top of their lungs, crucify him. Because he didn't come in as the king they wanted. 
Verse 15, here's a response from the chief priest and the scribes. I didn't read it to you. When the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done. In other words, they watched the supernatural acts uh, uh, that Jesus performed and the teaching that was so beyond any hu human wisdom. And when they saw all the wonderful things they had done, here's their response. They were indignant. The verse says they were indignant. And then by Friday, Matthew 27, all the crowds, all they can say, all they can say in response is crucify him, crucify him. And, and this is just, listen, this is not re, just revealing a first century Jerusalem crowd. This is revealing your heart and mind to ourselves. This is so important because it's revealing that we have trouble with kingship. Now, I want that to penetrate your heart. We have trouble with kingship. Because a king means a sovereign. And a sovereign means one who has authority over every aspect of your being. A sovereign means that it is one who has authority. Say so over every aspect of your being and your own heart and your own flesh and especially your culture tears you away from that, screams out uh, as loudly as possible, no, no, nobody has authority over me. We, we have no problem accepting Christ as Savior. I mean, it's not hard to admit I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. It's not hard to admit that. And that there's rebellion in me. I can do that. And it's, it's not hard to admit that I need a Savior. We have no problem receiving him as Redeemer. It's not hard for me to accept that I'm in bo the, the bondage that I'm in. My sin creates dependencies in me that I can't break out from. Uh, and it's not that hard uh, for me to, ex to accept his help to break those bondages. We have no trouble embracing Christ as friend or brother. He calls himself both of those things uh, when he resurrects from the dead. It's, hard, it's not hard at all to accept Christ as friend. I mean, he told his disciples, when I go to the cross, our relationship will change. And, and, and that's not hard to embrace. But we've got no appetite for his kingship. We've got no appetite for him as king. So this is important. Uh, there, are only, there are only two responses. There are only two responses to his kingship. Not three. There are only two. Not three. Um, and I just want us to think about them for a moment and we're going to pray. Uh, the first response is reject him. Just reject him as king. That's the first, it's a leg, legitimate response. It's the wrong response, but it, at least it's legitimate. I mean, that's what the religious leaders did. They were indignant to his claim. How dare you declare yourself king over my life and authority over my life? Later, all the crowd joined them in that. I mean, in fact, Jesus tells a parable about himself in Luke 19 that I almost never hear taught in, uh, anywhere. One line of it sticks out. The parable is about himself, and he tells it. And it's about this nobleman who goes and receives a kingdom. He receives a kingdom. Uh, and it says uh, in Luke 19, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man rule over us. That is the response. That is the first primary and most natural response from any human heart to Jesus. Because we're bent toward rebellion to God. That's our sin. That's what sin is. Our own self-centeredness is the core problem of my life. That's the first. Re there are two responses to his claim, but not three. There are two, but there are not three. And the second one is to surrender. As sovereign over my life, 
He is sovereign. He has authority over every single aspect of my life. What he says is what I live by. If you realize that he is who he says he is, God in flesh, if he came to re redeem us from our brokenness and lostness and emptiness, if he came to give us eternal life, a life full of hope and purpose and meaning and eternity in his presence where you're made newer each day, then surrender. Then surrender to his sovereignty over you in every part of your life. That's the second, that is the second legitimate response. There are two responses to his demand, but not a third. And, and, and this is not, this is not a legitimate response, number three, not the third just pretend that he's your king. Not legitimate. His kingship comes with his rule over your life. And when you live under his rule, you live by the principles of his rule. And look, the two choices are reject his principles and he's not your king. Or live by his principles because he is your king. But you cannot pretend that he is your king and then refuse to live by the principles of his rulership over you. It's illegitimate. Is Jesus the king he says he is or is he not? If he is, then it should reset your life. And pretending... It's not even an option. I want you to listen to Titus 2 for a moment. Titus 2, 11 through 13. For, this, for the grace of God has appeared. The grace of God that has appeared is Jesus appearing as God in flesh and going to the cross for us and pouring out his grace and mercy uh, on us in salvation. That's the grace of God appearing. And so what does that do in a person's life? If 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 that grace, if the Lord Jesus becomes king, what does that do in your life? Bringing salvation, but then verse 12, but also instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the Lord. Uh, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is a king. He has a kingdom. And his kingdom, listen, is a kind of life. There's a set of life principles that define it. Those life principles are written in, in the Bible itself, God's word to us. Uh, you know, the, the world has recently coined a term for a life that is denying ungodliness and worldly desires, living sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. The world now has a term for that. You know what that word is? Moralism. It's kind of this sort of fake smart way to say living a godly life is too moral and it's bad in, in some undefined way. Listen, that's just devil talk. The one who says I surrender to his kingship in my life means that I surrender to live by the principles of his kingdom in my life. And, and can I just lay a couple of those principles before you? I'm just going to go straight to the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, here are the principles of his kingdom. I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to, I'm going to list a few just for you to get this taste of how the world skews us so much. If he's king of my life, if he's sovereign over every aspect of my life, what is his principles for me? Just coming out of the Sermon on the Mount, his principle is if you've hurt or harmed anyone, you got to go and make it right. And if someone has hurt or harmed you, you gotta, you, you've got to go through the process of learning to forgive and releasing them. From the Sermon on the Mount, his principle is moral purity. 
And I'm, I'm going to say this unashamedly and without any embarrassment at all. You've got to stay absolutely faithful to your marriage. Don't have an affair. You'll destroy so much. That's the principle of of the Sermon on the Mount, the principles of His kingdom. Don't hook up. And don't look for hookups. You're looking for hookups. You're not struggling with something. You're pretending. Don't look at another with sexual desire. Stay far away from pornography. It decays you from the inside out. You got to get rid of you got to get rid of a heart of sensuality, of constantly stirring illicit sexual desire. If that sounds strange to you, it is because that's what the world has done to you. His principle is moving on. Be truthful, honest, get, get rid of all the deception in you. His principle is love. Well, love who? Well, love your family and love your neighbor and love your stranger and love your enemy. That covers it, right? It means to offer yourself to care for anyone around you. Moving on, it means to treat others the way you want to be treated. That's dignity and respect for every other human being. His principle is this. Stop being so phrenic about everything earthly that everyone else is chasing after. Don't fret about the things the people without God fret about, Jesus said. I mean, his ultimate principle is this. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears no fruit or bad fruit. And that's the way it will be in your life. Your fruit, what comes out of you, is the evidence of what's in you. Do you have the courage to tell yourself the truth? What is the fruit of your heart? Your desires, your character tell you about yourself. Honestly, just one question. And Jesus asked it in the Luke version of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a culminating moment of the Luke version of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, I'm a king. And a king is a sovereign. And a sovereign has absolute authority over every aspect of your life. And here's the question. I want us to go to the question. Then Jesus culminates by saying, why do you call me Lord? Why? Why? Why do you call me Lord? And don't do what I say. I want us to bow together. And I want us to spend a moment here just being honest. We're going to take a moment because I want you to pray. I want us to spend a moment here and look. I'm making a distinction here between maybe something you're struggling with and just pretending. All of us have weaknesses and we sin and James says we all stumble in many ways. But I'm describing something different. I'm struggling with something. I'm describing, I'm just pretending. I say Jesus is king of my life. Eh. I'm the king and I'm the one. I want you to break that in this moment. Break the pretending. I'm calling you to declare him king over you. I don't have, I mean, God's spirit is moving and I, I know he's speaking into your heart and I want to be quiet for a moment. Let him speak. I'm asking you to pray and respond to him. And here's how, God, I surrender. God, I repent. God, I want to sincerely follow Christ as king of my life. Just let that happen. Just let that happen for a moment.
Lord Jesus, this has been so heavy for me in preparing because I just keep looking into my uh, looking into my life and I have so much more growing to do. But I want to declare again, Jesus is Lord and King over me. And that where my opinion and Jesus' opinion is different, I surrender to his opinion. And I follow him. And I live for him. And I pray you're doing that in the body of Christ in this world. Pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. We enter. Oh, man. I can't believe it. You are an incredible church. I mean, most preachers will be thinking, do I, do I get my resume ready after a message like that? Or what do I do? Look at you, church. Just embrace it. So it's what I want. It's what I, I want him to be Lord of my life. We enter the time of the Lord's Supper. Paul the Apostle tells us that we commune with Christ in a way we don't fully understand when we take the symbols, the elements of the Lord's Supper. I want to ask you to open your heart to that. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. Uh, in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, an unworthy manner would be someone who is not a Christ follower to take part in, in, in the Lord's Supper. And if you're not a Christ follower, you're so welcome in, in this moment, but you're welcome to watch it. You, this is good for you to see the body of Christ and how we worship. An unworthy manner would also, though, be someone who names Christ, but they have no intention to obey. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. That's an unworthy manner. Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. So in a moment, we're going to pray. Our, our deacons are going to come. They're going to begin to serve. And in, uh, in the plate, the tray, you'll see a double cup. You'll take the double cup out and hold it. There's a bread element in the bottom and then the, and then the juice element. And so, you know, you might want to sort of break those apart and just hold them. I'll come back and we'll take these elements together. But this is a moment for you to move into communion. Just ask the Lord Jesus to show himself to you. And so, deacons, if you'll come, Father, this is a moment that we just so want to be renewed in your presence. We give it to you. We declare Jesus as king over our lives. Pray in Jesus' name.
fall onto my knees in awe And the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your life Your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful that night that he that Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal after about 1400 years of the very same meal year after year after year after year after year meaning this was the Passover lamb he suddenly broke it and changed he broke the bread and he lifted it up and he said it's not the Passover lamb this is me this is my body given for you do it take this in remembrance of me then in the same way meaning totally disrupting the Passover meal the ancient Passover meal at the end of the meal he takes a cup and he raises it up and says this is my blood and it represents a brand new covenant and the old covenant the old covenant is passing away in this moment and there's a brand new covenant in my blood and that is that I shed my blood for all of your sin to pay the penalty for all of your sin for eternity and when you look at it I want you to remember I want you to remember my death on the cross for you and the love and the mercy and the grace Pour it out. As often as you do it, do this, take this in remembrance of me. We stand, we worship together for a moment. Let's lift him up. Come on, let's sing of his goodness in this place. And glory, glory, hallelujah.
is the last uh, word. Uh, I, I want to invite you to Easter and all the ways I describe, but pray for it. Please pray for God's hand. It should be so powerful over Easter, over uh, us. Uh, secondly, if uh, you're a Bear Creek family member and you haven't turned in a First Things First card, this is the moment. You can dr drop those off at those uh, giving uh, receptacles. Hey, if you have a prayer need, if you want to pray with someone about anything at all, we have two prayer areas right here at the back of the room. Please feel free to go there and just say, would you pray with me about this? And there's someone there who would just love to do that. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you next time. Bless you.